uh, reasons. If you look at the kind of publication that he has brought out, the PhD thesis that he has uh, produced, and the number of seminars uh, you know he has uh, uh, you know presented, all these actually uh, indicate um, you know his uh, scholarship and his commitment to uh, the higher standards in uh, research and and uh, academics in, in general. Um, Professor Natarajan got his uh, master's degree. Uh, from PhD College of Arts and Science, Coimbatore, uh, in 1983, and uh, became a, an assistant professor in the same uh, uh, college. And he taught there for uh, 11 years. And from there, he went to uh, <coughs> Mananmaniam uh, Sundarnar uh, University at Tirunelveli as associate uh, uh, professor, where he taught uh, for 14 long uh, uh, years. And in the meantime, he also went to uh, mm -hmm. Ethiopia. He went to Addis Ababa University as associate professor. He taught there for two years, returned from there, and then two years later, he joined the Periyar University as a uh, uh, professor. Uh, professor Natarajan has uh, co authored uh, uh, four books and has published research papers in national and international uh, uh, journals. And he has also uh, written uh, chapters uh, for several books. And his area of his his uh, areas of interest include culture and communication studies, new media studies, film studies, development uh, uh, studies. Uh, and apart from uh, teaching, he has been culturally active. He has acted in uh, the Tamil film Palai uh, that was in 2011. Uh, this film got an international uh, award in uh, Norway, and he has produced two. Uh, documentaries um, and the title of one documentary was Ruins and the other was uh, Close Your Eyes and he has uh, produced an education film titled Intelligence and he has guided many PhD uh, students and uh, I'm sure he's still fortunate that uh, he agreed to uh, speak to us uh, today on uh, uh, sampling. Uh, <clears throat> You know, I must welcome all of you, uh, our uh, chairman, uh, Dr. Satish Kumar, uh, you know, our, uh, you know, colleague, uh, uh, Varghese, my colleague, uh, Satya Prakash. There are many teachers, research scholars, and uh, MEA students. I welcome them all. And on behalf of uh, the uh, university, on behalf of the department, on behalf of all of you who are uh, going to participate in uh, in, in this uh, webinar. I warmly welcome Professor uh, Natarajan and over to Natarajan now. Dr. Purnananda, my dear colleague, uh, Professor Vargis, Professor Satish Kumar, my colleagues I recognize uh, in the net that they have joined uh, a very hearty good afternoon to one and all of you. I don't know whether I am worthy of all the praise and the kind words that Purnananda just uh, uh, said about me. I, I, I wish that uh, I become uh, aware of that and I deserve that. Thank you very much, Purna. Uh, you have always been a wonderful uh, colleague since uh, our seminar days when uh, Dr. K.V. Nagaraj uh, invited us uh, for uh, this Mangalore conference and I had the chance to meet him and uh, posted dinner discussions. We had lengthy discussions during that time. And since then, uh, we have been uh, coordinating uh, the activities, academic activities. I have uh, served as uh, his uh, thesis adjudicator and he has served on my panel and it was very nice uh, to note that. I, I recognize my successor, Professor Nandakumar, in the, in the, in the audience. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, even during this pandemic, uh, Purnananda has evoked to such a response and uh, Satish was very supportive and uh, he uh, took all the efforts. Though this is a webinar, uh, we have uh, taken so much of pains and so much of uh, exchanges and uh, and the discussions that took place uh, to fix this uh, meeting. I thank each and every one of you, starting from Purna, Satish, and Varghese, and others, and my colleagues here in Salem, 
and uh, Periyar University and uh, Tirnelveli and Coimbatore. Coming to the topic that uh, we have been uh, thinking about, uh, sampling. And the moment uh, he listed out some of the topics, I said uh, sampling is of interest to me for the simple reason that uh, all our studies have used one form of sample or the other. And uh, I wanted to always uh, put forth these ideas to the upcoming uh, uh, research scholars so that they will have an idea of uh, what sampling means and what uh, it can uh, uh, it can mean to the researcher and the data that he collects and uh, whatever he he does with the data is primarily dependent on the word called uh, uh, sampling. So I I I, I started thinking about uh, these things uh, while uh, uh, preparing myself for uh, this uh, uh, webinar, and uh, that immediately came to my attention that uh, we uh, have always studied that uh, sampling is of two types. One is uh, probability, the other one is non-probability, and uh, the non-probability samples uh, have the idea of the researcher in mind primarily in order to collect the sample. And the probability sample has got its own uh, statistical probability to be represented in the study. So th this kind of distinctions are very clear in the textbook. So I thought I will start with uh, what we can, we can understand by this sampling and why this sampling is important to uh, study, especially this communication and media uh, research. So this immediately takes me back to uh, Ethiopia, where Purna introduced uh, while while introducing. He said that I served for two years, and there I was talking with one of uh, an Ethiopian, and he said uh, I had a, a train journey from Coimbatore to Chennai, and uh, that journey I encountered a bomb blast, and uh, it was very terrifying. He said that. Uh, imagine that we have got uh, about 3 million kilometers of uh, train coverage every day by our Indian railways. And uh, it is very unfortunate that I met that person in Ethiopia and that gentleman undertook this journey. And that was the only time when there was uh, what is known as uh, a bomb blast. Uh, one person got seriously injured, I think, in the e -road station, which is about uh, 100 kilometers from Coimbatore. And uh, that was the only time I remember that there was a blast in Indian railways and uh, they, they were due to some reasons. And he was unfortunately in the next coach and there was a lot of uh, halabu and uh, there was a problem. And when he was talking to me, I am an, a representative of uh, India. And we had a chance meeting on the Addis Ababa road. And he recollects only this one incident. And this is unfortunately the only incident that I could remember that there was a train blast in Tamil Nadu where uh, somebody was involved and uh, something was happening and there was some problem. So I thought about the statistical probability of that person meeting me and uh, talking about this only train blast. So this is the randomness and this is what we mean by sample. So when I asked him about how you like uh, uh, India and our extensive train network, I had a nightmare of uh, rail uh, travel. He said that and he was narrating that one incident. So can this one incident be representative of the whole of the uh, train journey that we organized? There are thousands of trains which go, go punctual to that a minute and second. We have got so many express trains that are being operated inside the state and inside the, uh, between several states. But unfortunately, this one gentleman's sample experience was from this one incident. So this, I want you to keep it as a pointer that we will come to a little later. I had coffee there. And uh, I used to uh, frequent to a place uh, near my university. And uh, there was one gentleman who wished me well. He said, hi, you have come here to teach? I said, yes. Uh, then you must be teaching my people. How do you find my people? I said, everybody's fine. You're all very nice and very uh, affable persons. And I, I really like your culture and uh, this uh, nice attitude that you have towards uh, foreign teachers. And he said, I wish you well. Uh, 
have a pleasant stay. Let this coffee be on me. That is what he said. And I have one experience, sample experience of one Ethiopian. And that Ethiopian offered me coffee. He doesn't even know me. He did not know me at the time of our having coffee. And he just wished me well. And he gave me coffee. And he said, I, I like you. I like you that you are serving my country. And uh, I wish you well. See, now we have got uh, two simple one incident samples. If that has to be taken into account for our research, if a researcher collects a data from one sample and that sample happens to be the sample that you simply drew and suddenly you come to the conclusion, what will be the kind of conclusion that we will arrive at? And this is what sampling is all about. So sampling is probably what uh, the, the experience that we collect from, uh, from our uh, field and what, what we know as, supposing we are now talking about the sampling vocabulary, then we need to understand what is known as a uh, sample and what is known as a population. Population doesn't mean the Indian population that we are talking about or the people. The population will mean that the, the, the data from uh, the, we have to collect from those representative uh, uh, concepts that we have in the field and we need to draw that to our study. So whatever I will be talking will be based on the students, the scholars that they pursued PhD under my guidance. I've got about a dozen PhD scholars who have uh, uh, collected their degrees to, under my guidance. So the strength is derived from those uh, studies. So this sample that we draw, uh, why we do that? It is because we cannot go to the entire uh, a group of people who represent our study, whom we are interested in, and we want to uh, know about them. So it is a simple, easy, objective, and an accurate way of knowing what the whole of the population or the group or the characteristic is. It will hold good for a study on content analysis. It will hold good for a focus group discussion. It will hold good for our survey also. So when we are going to do go across a, a, view, a, a variety of methodologies, we all find people there. We collect data, what is known as uh, the, the, the data points or what is known as things that are there in the field that we want to make conclusions about. So we want to understand the concept. What is the concept? Like we said, uh, we are, there is a lot of uh, fake news that is uh, circulated around in the WhatsApp and the social media, and people are getting carried away by that. So what are we trying to do? We want to find out how uh, the, the fake, the percentage of fake news that we want to assess. So if you want to assess that, then we need to find out how much of news is getting circulated and how much percentage of that is fake. So to do that, we need to know how much the quantity of uh, information is getting circulated. And from that, we need to deduce what is the percentage or likely percentage of uh, uh, news which are probably fake. So to understand this, we need to have two, three sets of data and we need to define all that. So your population will consist of, like, for example, in the IT terminology, they will say, is that populated enough? When uh, you talk about uh, immunization, people say, what is the kind of population that we have? So if you are talking about the virus, what is the strength of the pop virus population? So this is what they say. Population is a group where well, well, the target characteristics are impregnated there in that. And that sample unit will have to be collected in order to understand what it uh, contains and what it says. So we call that as population. So a population is what uh, is our target group from which we want to deduce or on which we want to make assumptions. The assumption will be that we are interested in finding out the quantum of fake news that is being circulated. So what are the kinds of uh, fake? Then we need to have a typology of uh, the, the, the fake news that appear. People who want to dupe, people who want to fake, people who want to spoof, people who want to simply misguide uh, others. People just have the fun of circulating certain data which are probably gibberish. So all these are there in the social media and it is uh, the responsibility of the user to go find out whether 
that is fake or not fake and it is up to us the consumers to understand yes it is fake so we need to be wary of that so tomorrow suddenly there is going to be a strike announcement suddenly there is going to be a quarantine suddenly there is going to be a pandemic outbreak suddenly for people in cash on the vulnerability of the public mind and they want to just spread something for the kick of it and it is up to the law enforcing agency it is up to the research scholars it is up to the social media researchers to find out and assess and keep saying that yes it is a very potential weapon like for example in the uh, arab spring we found that uh, yes it was uh, paving way for a new kind of a revolution like in tamil nadu we saw the wadi wasal campaign where people wanted uh, the bull fight to be an identity of their uh, tamil language and culture and they wanted to just restore that ensure that it is sustained so all sorts of simultaneous uh, uprising came and thanks to the social media and thanks to people who came there in, in millions and they saw to that the government could not intervene in a conventional traditional sport uh, or conventional traditional or uh, uh, cultural activity this cultural activity is what we are bothered here and this is what we are uh, talking about when you want to study about that in full then it is not possible to probably connect all the uh, three or four million people who have gathered there so what we would have done probably go take a sample of anybody who is there and try to find out and ascertain yes these are the people who participated in the event and uh, let us find out and uh, uh, what is the kind of attitude they brought to this particular fight so if we want to do that um, yeah, except for the government we don't have uh, uh, a possibility of taking data from all the stakeholders it is not possible and we call that as a census method it is done once in 10 years people enumerate and do this for 3 4 years and nobody has the kind of energy nobody has the budget and nobody has the wherewithal to do that kind of a, a data collection and it is also not possible we don't want that we don't want data uh, from all units for example uh, we 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 go write uh, uh, material we go to take a piece of material we write and we collect all that and we want to find out whether it is correct or not also you sample one page and try to look at it and find out whether the typography is right the print out has come correctly then we say you sample 10 pages it is enough you don't have to look at each and every page to find out whether all the pages 27 pages that we have printed the are have come out correctly so to do that we take a sample of uh, just a fifth of that and that will give you an idea of whether uh, all the pages are printed number 2 then you flip through all the page numbers page numbers have come then you collect you take at random one sheet and try to find out whether the margins are correct yes margin is correct the ink has distributed uh, uniformly so this is enough to ensure that this particular 27 page booklet that we wanted to prepare and submit has uh, uh, contains all the material that we have prepared elsewhere and we wanted an output of that so all these conversions take place these conversions also take place in our research so we want to find out we want to do a content analysis of uh, the newspapers depicting a uh, two interstate riparian dispute for example this kaveri water is going on and how karnataka papers and tamil nadu papers have reported that so if a student wanted to do that he will do a content analysis it got it uh, into its peak about 2 years ago and everybody started talking about kaveri and uh, that was there in the newspaper so my researcher wanted to find out he wanted to do a content analysis this frame how people have understood kaveri right so karnataka papers and uh, if you want to understand this is it necessary that you go and find out each and every newspaper each and every day how they have reported this and try to ascertain to do that you require a lot of effort and energy at the time when research scholars are not supported greatly by the administration like the university which pays uh, a small amount as a compensation for uh, university research, research fellowship ugc jrf which is uh, very few and far between for any of us uh, in 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 your department and my department there are only a couple of ugc jrf fellows and they don't have the privilege of getting that kind of a fat sum 
So with all this in mind, a research scholar has to go and collect all the papers in Karnataka, all the papers in Tamil Nadu, all the Kannada papers and all the English papers and all the Tamil papers and all the English papers published in Tamil Nadu and Karnataka and collect all that. And uh, if you want to do a study, then it may take ages and years and it is not possible. So what do we do? He consults uh, the, the supervisor and he says, go collect, uh, find out what is the time period. So the time period is from January 2019 to December 2019. There are 365 days. So now why don't you just take a sample which will be meaningful? So if you want to draw a sample from already published source, then there is a methodology. So the methodology can be either guided by what the researcher wants, purposive, judgmental, or self-selection, or a quota sample. You can do any of this, still you are right. Or as the guide has said, sir, let us go for a, a random sample, the magic number called, name called random. And that random number is uh, statistically more sound. It offers a much better opportunity for us to generalization. So why don't you go for a random uh, methodology? So what I was uh, talking earlier about uh, a purposive sample, judgmental sample, quota sample, self-selection sample, all these are non-random samples, which means uh, I have an objective in mind. I want to select only those samples where uh, newspapers, where the article has come. I want to study only that. Still, I may not be wrong, but there are certain issues that we need to discuss discuss about at the end of this uh, discussion. So non-random sample allows us to go sample the same content and the random sample also will allow us to go do the sampling of this content. But the only issue is the method, the plan with which we go. So we call that as a sampling plan. So when we are talking about sampling, methodology, we need to understand that there is a random methodology, there is a non-random methodology, there is a plan involved, there is a method involved, and there is something called a procedure we need to adopt. So any research that you do, you have to justify A to your supervisor and the guide and convince him that I am going to collect this and B, your uh, team, the doctoral committee, which consists of an external expert and he, he has to get convinced that yes, your sampling method is all right. And C, before uh, you pre present this uh, thesis for uh, adjudication, a pre-PhD viva is conducted, you will have to convince the general public there. And then four, there is an external there sitting elsewhere and he must understand in his uh, imagination and in his uh, intellectual acumen that yes, the sample that you have uh, uh, adopted is all right for this study. So to do that, there is a justification that is required. So if you and I can justify, yes, this quota sample is all right. From the month of January, I'm going to collect three newspapers from the month of February. So if every month I am going to collect three papers and analyze the whole the content, one in Canada, one in Tamil, based on the circulation, based on the reach, based on the price, based on anything you say, if you are convinced, if there is some review available that so-and-so in his study has accepted this as a sample method, yes, we are interested in accepting it. Why? Because scientific method always believes that if it is reproducible, we will accept it. If it is reviewable, we will accept it. If it can be proved, yes, we will accept it. So science believes in the reviewability, then the provability, when it can be accepted, when it can be collaborated, when it can be evaluated, then I agree with you, right, go ahead with your sample. So I, I do all these parameters and I say, sir, for every month, I will take five samples, sir. And uh, altogether, uh, 60 samples I will collect, sir. And I will collect all the stories that appeared for and against Kaveri and trying to tell you whether this is all right. Yes, it is representative of the whole uh, year. So fine, let us do that. Why? Because that was the time when the entire uh, Kaveri issue was at its peak and both the uh, states, uh, they went to approach the Supreme Court and they went to the central government for uh, redress and that is the reason why it was at its peak and they both were throwing tantrums and we wanted to understand that. So let us go. How the Canada papers have done that, how English papers published in Karnataka has done that, how Tamil papers have done that and how English papers published in Tamil Nadu has done that. So I take a representative. 
if i am going to talk about judgmental or purposive sample the purpose for which i am going to study this is simply to understand and ascertain whether the kaveri issue is framed in the proper sense of the term whether the framing is all right what is framing analysis to understand that we need to go into the theory and concept and try to find out how by use of words by use of imagery by use of uh, discourse by use of continuous campaign you try to portray certain things to the public so if i want to do that i want to frame a certain issue in a certain way if i want to portray you in a good light then i will use certain tools when i want to portray you in a, in a not very good light then i I'll, I'll, i'll put you in a certain uh, frame so this framing people have understood and studied and said these are the frames that are available then we can go and try to tell people yes this is what i'm going to do so for that i am going to select sample and that selection will be judgmental that selection will be based on the purpose for which the news report was done and i want to select that and we call that as non random sample but still it is acceptable why because the objective of my study is to understand the kaveri issue from two different perspectives and that is the reason why i am choosing these two words this is a non obtrusive technology already that is published we call it content analysis i sorry i want to do a textual analysis discourse critical discourse whatever i want to do i'll do sir so you convince your guide first you convince yourself first and if you can do this kind of sample yes i agree with you on that supposing the same is taken to the realm of uh, random sampling method what is the random sampling method uh, people say that uh, if i come into your class and try to find out uh, how many people have cell phones in your class maybe that's a basic question i want to find out what is the economic status of your yourself represented by your cell phone worth for example how many people have a cell phone inside 10000 between 10 and 15 10 15 and 20 about 20 if i want to categorize people into four different categories then i enter into a classroom randomly i pick one person anybody has a chance of being represented in that if there is an unknown factor there every unit what is a sampling unit each and every person who we want to study and make a judgment about is called a unit so the sampling unit is there the class consisting of 20 people each of the person is called a sampling unit so there are 20 units there you don't know who i am i don't know who you are i will go to the second row third person i pick up one um, gentleman satish and i ask him the question what is the worth of your cell phone if i do that if there is no inherent bias in that if there is it is everything is purely random then everybody has a chance of getting represented if that chance is given to the sampling we call that as a random sample so random sample apply that technology to the random uh, article selection i will say uh, we'll go to the um, january month uh, collect uh, fifth day 15th day 25th day the three days and find out how kaveri is reported there uh you didn't know that i'll i'll choose pick 5 uh, and i will give it a interval of 10 i have done that by using a methodology called systematic sampling what is systematic sampling when i don't know which of the issue will be covered there i don't know what is the date the first date i am going to fix everything at random and i am going to pick it can be 3 13 and 23 it can be 7 17 and 27 anything can be that number so fix one number at random and add a value and collect the 60 samples based on the first number every uniform interval you collect that data we call that as systematic sample so what is the value of systematic sample on that day kaveri issue could have been discussed on that day kaveri issue of no issue could have been blown out of proportion on that day it could have not been reported at all so that randomness we give and kaveri reported by karnataka newspaper tamil nadu newspaper it is very neutral it is very pro state it is very is pro establishment any judgment you can come based on the data that you collect from that kind of a sample it is scientific it is purely random why it is random because you don't know whom i am going to call supposing i come to three classes 
uh, one professor uh, uh, Purna, another professor Satish, and the third one, Professor Pargis. So to each of the classes I come and I, I ask for the roll number 12, register number 12. You don't know, I don't know who that 12 is. So I ask the value of the cell phone that is possessed by roll number 12 in Professor Satish's class, in Professor Purna's class, and Professor Pargis's class. So if I collect that and come to the conclusion that the students own a cell phone, majority of the cases between 12 and 17,000 rupees. If I come to that conclusion based on the data that I collect from a systematic random sample method, it is perfectly valid. It is perfectly generalizable. So we call that because there is a system involved, there is a number involved and that number is random. How I came, arrived at 12, you don't know, I don't know. It is uh, maybe it is from a random number generation table, maybe it is from a computer, maybe it is from a cell phone. You ask uh, random numbers to be generated by the cell phone. You give me from one to 200, generate uh, 20 random numbers. Then uh, now there are systems and applications which will give you 20 uh, numbers at random. So which is perfectly fine. Nobody knows who is going to be represented. Nobody knows the worth of the cell phones that each of the student possesses. It is fine. We call that a systematic. Simple random, when I say simple random, I allow each and every sample unit to be represented. For that, I go to Purna's class and I ask him, uh, Purna, can you send me three people? Uh, for what, Natarajan? No, I want three people, just uh, you name them. So he says, supposing I say, Purna, I want your permission. Let me go and choose from first row, from third row, from fifth row. You don't even know what rows I'm going to call up. There is a randomness involved. If there is no bias, what is bias? A bias is probably uh, an idea, a favorable or a disfavorable opinion that can be generated, that can be kept in, that can be impregnated in yourself and that can be reflected in the selection. Supposing I have not seen uh, Shimoga, then a person from Shimoga, I may not know. I don't know. I am uh, exposed to Bangalore. So I will say anybody from Bangalore here? There is a small bias that comes. You allow somebody to go and choose. They choose people whom they know. They choose people whom uh, they, they think they are familiar with. So if that familiarity is removed from that sample, we call that as a random number, a random selection, a random method. So if, if that it can be implemented, like for example, if it is a simple random method, the sample will contain data which can be very, very representative. You might think that, sir, what is the probability of uh, the person who has got 60,000 rupees cell phone coming into that sample? What you think is what I also think. I don't know if the role number 12 is the most stinking rich person that you could find on the campus. And if he or she is there sitting in the role number 12, I don't know. Maybe it is representative. It has come out. Each person has got equal chance. And that person, that girl, that boy, one who has got 60,000 rupees cell phone there, and it comes, and maybe in the statistical distribution, we call it an outlier. In uh, probably in Shimoga campus, the, uh, the average uh, value of the cell phone should be about 23,000 rupees. When you come to Periyar University, probably the average value will be about 12,000 or 11,000 rupees. You go to Madras University, maybe it is about 18,000 rupees. We don't know. You go to Christ College, uh, Christ, uh, for example. You go to Indian Institute of Management, for example. If the value is about 45,000 rupees, the population itself has got that, that kind of a representation. And anybody who goes and picks up there, so you go to an IAD, you go to an ISB. So all these names, when you are representative, then each of these things will reflect in the data. If it is not represented, that is the reason why it can go astray. Your conclusions based on the data that is collected, not representative of the population may go wrong. That is the reason why we say kindly verify always with the objective and try to find out what is that you want to come to, what is that you want to understand, what is that you want to study, whether that uh, variable is present there, whether you are studying the correct data, for example, let me tell you this. I want to go and buy uh, a Hyundai car. Okay. I want to buy a, a car from the Hyundai stable. So I go to a showroom. That showroom contains uh, Honda cars. Can you uh, get an answer for Hyundai from the Honda showroom? That is what is simply a data which is reflective of the population 
the data, what whether it will serve your objective. Every time you go collect the data, yes, you are collecting data about a four-wheeler. Yes, it is a mid-segment passenger car. Yes, it is a two-box car. Everything is fine. Whether you want to buy from a Honda stable or a Hyundai stable, that is all that matters. So you wanted to buy a Hyundai car, you went to a Honda showroom. This is what is the data representation, data representative of the population, data reflective of the objective that you have. So the objective is there. Most of the time, when you start working on the data, either we miss out on the objective, either we miss out on the hypothesis, we concentrate so much on the population and the data, suddenly if the link is not there, when you go for your data analysis, that will be, uh, the problem will start there. We wanted to know this, but uh, the data comes the other way, so what will we do? So each and every time you need to have that plumb line ready. What is the plumb line? What guides my research? And how the sampling will help me to do that research. Right. Coming back to our sampling. So we said that uh, the non-random sampling method will consist of uh, a quota, a type of, uh, uh, for example, if you come to Tamil Nadu, then uh, uh, some, some districts represented in the West, Coimbatore, Erode, Tirupur, some in the center, uh, Tirchi, uh, Salem, some in the east, maybe Chennai, Chengalpat, Kanjivaram, some in the south, Madurai, Ternalveli. So all this, I have a quota of each and every region to be represented, go specifically collect so that I am representative of the whole of Tamil Nadu. It is fine. You are not leaving anything behind. To do this in the random method, we also have what is known as stratification. So what is the stratification? Make the sampling units into smaller manageable subunits. We call that as stratum. So what is a stratum? Stratum is the smallest to homogeneous unit which uh, represents the bigger multiple stratified population. So the population consists of several factors. People living in Bangalore, they exhibit a different mentality. You go to Darwin, they exhibit a totally different uh, mentality. You come to near or to Hyderabad, the places are there, and it, they exhibit a different kind of mentality. So cosmopoliteness is there, but still, if you go take samples there, their attitude can be totally different. Where they live, where they come from. There are so many substratifications and classifications inside people, and we want to accommodate that in our data. So what do we do? We do that by way of stratification. So what is stratification? I manage that into smaller subgroups and each of the subgroups, we call that as stratified sample, which is called a random method. Why? Because I don't know whom I am going to select in Coimbatore, but still I am select people. So when I want to uh, find out the youth of Coimbatore, Salem, Madurai, and Chennai, how they behave to a certain situation, then I will go to each of these four cities and collect sample, about 100 each, come back, analyze, and try to find out, put them in a basket, and this uh, statistical units, what they will say, whether this group is a, uh, the samples are drawn from a similar background or from a different background. That is what the statistics will say. So the statistical test will say uh, people from Chennai, from Coimbatore, from Salem and uh, Madurai or Ternalveri, all these uh, five, uh, four cities, whether these groups when put together, whether they exhibit a single characteristic or multiple characteristic. If it is multiple characteristic, then we stratify them, try to find out whether it is different and significantly different. And uh, your T and F test will tell you whether the sample that you have drawn is truly representative of the population from where it is drawn. And yes, reasonably certain that you can say and generalize that this is reflective of a population which is distinct from each of the three. Like, for example, if you are going to find out uh, the teaching effectiveness of uh, four of us, for example, we have Vargisir, Satish here, Purna, and myself. 
so we go and collect uh, data from all the four of our students you take one, either one paper or you take different papers no issues you can control for the paper or you can uh, leave it free so find out and uh, from a pre and post test as to the effectiveness of our classroom teaching of uh, p for purna n for natarajan s for satish and uh, v for vargis so collect all the data and pull that together 1 to 400 number and try to do a test and if the test has got a variance if the test exhibits a certain kind of a difference then we go to each and every subject and try to say p1 to 100 n1 to 100 s1 to 100 and v1 to 100 try to find out whether there is any inter group similarity if they are totally different then we can reasonably to a certain extent say that the sample drawn from natarajan's class and purna's class and satish's class and vargis's class they are not from the same population they are different so if you can say that reasonably then the f test and t test will say will allow us to say with 95% confidence will allow us to say yes these data are different so to say that we stratify the population sufficiently clearly sufficiently uniquely so that it will give us a result so that holds good for the same uh, content analysis stratified proportionate sample stratified disproportionate sample purna's class can be about 45 students i am taking 20 satish's class can be 60 students i take 20 so immaterial of the class strength if i am going to draw equal number of sample we call that as disproportionate stratified random so purna's class has got uh, 45 so i will take uh, nine people satish's class got 65 so i am going to take 13 people if i am going to have some proportion re proportional representation of the strength reflecting the sample size thinking that the number of students to be drawn from each of the class should be representative of the class strength it should reflect uh, the class strength then i can do what is known as uh, systematic proportional strat uh, sampling stratified random sample so i can bring in system also so i go to purna's class and take from 111 uh, 1712 whatever number so if i take a systematic number i go to each and every class and take the same number and till that time uh, i achieve 13 till such time i achieve uh, 7 if i continue to draw the sample i call this as systematic stratified proportionate random sample method so by by implementing all this what we achieve is that there is a sense of scientificity in the sample data so if you do this kind of things then we make sure that the sample selection is unbiased we make sure that all units have equal chance of getting represented we make sure that it is truly representative of the population that we are or there is scientificity in our sampling method so random sample allows us generalization non random sample also because of the number allows us generalization we need to work on the review so uh, in a recent uh, conference uh, in a, in the in the department of commerce my colleague uh, quoted a statistician and said whether if the sample is large you can generalize still you can use all the parametric statistics even assuming normality of the distribution even in the uh, uh, non random sampling method even if the data is collected by using non random sample method there is statistical evidence it has been going on in the statistical fora quite consistently because of the number maybe the method uh, is non random but uh, still they represent the population you cannot say that they uh, do not represent the population just because i have selected uh, purposefully just because i wanted them to be included in the sample that doesn't mean there is a bias so this kind of an argument still goes on you can consult your guide each of uh, the students and scholars who are uh, listening to this and you can definitely say that implement even non uh, parametric statistics even in a non random sample method data so i i to that extent i can assure you that and one thing when we talk about the sample and uh, uh, the randomness when you are defending your this will be 
if you say the moment you say uh, because this is the key that i always use uh, whether you have understood the concept clearly supposing uh, uh, a scholar defends his thesis by saying i have used a simple random procedure then my first question will be have you listed all the sampling units have you listed do you know the population size and that have you generated sample after that have you used the strategy to draw the sample so if these four questions if you know if you are aware at least if you are not aware don't worry about it from now on you must defend your thesis by by the moment you say random method you need to know the full size of the population what, what does that mean supposing uh, normally we for our ph doctoral thesis we go collect data from the colleges and schools and education institutions uh, 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 representing youth so what, first thing you should say is that i have gone to this university and collected 2150 students who are studying in the campus i have listed them then i divided that into strata i divided them into arts and science blocks arts and science blocks each of the arts and science block i collected the two uh, representatives in the arts department i chose two departments one is journalism the other one is sociology in the science departments one is computer science other one is physics so from these two departments i said uh, first year and second year one uh, class each and after that i went to the each class and said uh, fifth and tenth student or at random three students after getting permission from that particular class immaterial whether people are present or absent i went from that particular day sought permission and we went and anybody available i distributed data to the 10th person and the 20th person inside the class i counted and i gave so if you can clearly say this you are rest assured that yes you have implemented a random design maybe you went there maybe your classmate uh, knows a person in physics maybe you went to the department of physics maybe you collected data there maybe that is the procedure but when you write you write you write in such a way that this is the justification for your random method otherwise don't use the word random people get disturbed by using this word i collected random number i collected random data i collected systematic data then he said now the next question will immediately come is how much of systematic data is yours now, now tell me sir what is uh, your 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 system you followed uh, what is the number that you decided uh, what was the interval the moment he says that if you understand so that the first number was 3 i collected every 15 students so 3 plus 15 18 18 plus 15 33 if you can say immediately then he will stop the question otherwise till such time you say don't know he will continue to ask questions so the scholars who are preparing the thesis if you are talking about systematic data then you say you fix the number and generate a class interval if you are talking about stratification sir i went to the university i stratified the department university into arts science commerce management language and from each one of these i collected one one uh, uh, i selected one one uh, year of study from each of the one one year of study i selected two samples so i selected 20 samples from this university i used a perfectly random method people will accept why you chose this particular university to this university sir i divided the map uh, my straight into four different distinct uh, areas from the north northern region my uh, i there were three universities the the university that came to me was this particular university so i used to this if there is a proper justification for your selection that's all is required so you write that it is not in doing the study that matters in justifying the study and making it look yes you have done that at random so this is where our people are not very uh, uh, adept people are not very keen so you need to be keen in writing this you need to be keen in defining this 15 20 pages of methodology what's it's only this what is your objective what is your uh, data collection tool how did you design the data how did you design the questionnaire who decided 55 items should be there what were the parameters that you wanted to test how many items tested each of these parameters 
how you cross tabulated it what were the statistical tools it is enough you do one multiple comparison and give the whole thesis a clarity of one t test is enough a clarity of one f test is enough a percentage analysis is more than enough for all of us the only thing is our people our scholars are interested in uh, writing the thesis and saying that i used a structural equation model yes e m but the explanation i find unfortunately is only for one page for the structural equation you must have spent about 3 hours but to write you have taken only 3 minutes you write only one page i know a thesis in education he did one three way analysis of f made it into two two way analysis then six one way analysis mean difference percentage one multiple comparison post hoc multiplication the data was so beautifully written he took all the independent and dependent variables measured that and uh, compared that and found out which interacted which which of the you know dependent variable and used that as a factor and started writing his thesis and the thesis was over with just one multiple comparison so where does the question lie in our writing ability in our expressing that and that is what we we need to look into more than the sample more than the data more than the data collection so all these days we have been uh, reviewing all these days we have been doing all that and we need to understand that after doing all this when you sit and write the data put that into practice put that into a thesis format there are a certain a certain basic criteria that it needs to fit that was very basic criteria if you understand then you are uh, you are you are uh, sampling your data your structure your question and your design your objective so all this will come back and reflect on only one thing called your objective so what are the objectives based on which you started collecting this data so whether this data warranted this particular travel this study for that you need to understand you have this particular budget you are not a company you are not a corporate you are not result oriented we don't want any of that to happen here so what is that you want so when you want your objective to be fulfilled and that objective needs to be very clearly very clearly uh, uh, kept in mind in each and every letter that you write in the thesis there are three objectives those three objectives are answered by these questions these are the parameters that i kept myself i i i analyzed to that this is what is the result this is why i used to the sample fine everybody will agree on that whether you are right in doing it. so to do that you need to be very very clear in the kind of sample that we were talking about so to to probably to sum up before people can ask uh, uh, their doubts and come for a discussion there are certain characteristics that we talk about for uh, sampling and those characteristics should be whether it reflects the objective that we have in mind any single item in the research is directly related to your objective directly related to the topic if it is not then don't do that don't touch that so your objective is very important if you can write your entire review based on the three objectives you have in mind fine that is what the examiner wants the examiner wants about 50 references for each objective so fix a minimum of 150 references for three objectives your review chapter you write about 60 to 70 pages of review of literature defining elaborating why you study these objectives that is enough then you write about the theoretical concept and the conceptual framework for which you are doing the research then about five pages intro all this is over methodology for about 10 15 pages of how you define your problem so problem identification whether it is representational of your uh, objective at hand population that you want to study and describe whether it is accurately depictive of the population that you want to describe
so if that is always that has to be kept in mind when you can uh, uh, go for data collection whether you do a purposive sample whether you do a case study method whether you do a, an ethno methodology nobody is bothered till such time your objective is fulfilled we are not bothered what method you take but that objective is very very important when you do a data presentation the presentation we mechanically start with the population description like uh, your demographics then go to the independent dependent variable close no 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 so when you talk about your uh, questionnaire you constructed a questionnaire you did a group discussion so what was the basis for that group discussion why you want to compare from the demographic point of view whether you found out that men and women will differ in their cell phone usage during night time so tell me who has done that study why you want to do it what is the research gap so if you want to find out a gender difference in people using cell phone uh, maybe uh, for example uh, the use the, the mad use of whatsapp uh, by men and women so do you do you conceive that educated people will use uh, whatsapp differently from uneducated people go find out so your sample should contain at least 30 to 40 people who are educated 30 to 40 people not so educated okay then you want to find out people who are working in very different professions they differ in their opinion uh, they differ in their method of use okay now find out teachers find out doctors find out engineers find out it people so which means there are about uh, five six subgroups which have come each sample is about 50 okay now you want to find out whether men and women differ in their opinion so uh, adequately represent men and women in the, your sample now the fourth one will be like india divided between city and uh, and the rural area do you find uh, that a class b class and c class cities will depict different uh, um, method different uh, behavior in uh, in in whatsapp use now try to ascertain that from people who are living in e, b class c class and uh, a class cities maybe you can divide it as rural semi urban and urban so your sample it can be sufficient which can be handful it can be small number 30 is a big number in statistics so each of these subgroups should have 30 numbers so that is what is known as sample size what is an ideal size everybody uh, says so many things about 5% 2% and there are there are lots and lots of uh, uh, talk uh, talk going on but uh, ideally speaking your uh, curve plateaus after 638 i have studied one uh, review i don't remember the name of the author one uh, reviewer has said all data infinite population or for example if you want to talk about generalize about people kannada people from tamil people their uh, cell phone usage it is enough the sample size has about 638 it plateaus after that but for that you need to find out a review you need to find out who has said that who has published that literature so how are you going to select 638 go stand in a majestic circle and find out 638 and say this population is representative of the whole of karnataka people then you may be way wrong in doing that because people living are people staying available in this particular majestic circle at 6 how do you populate karnataka how do you divide karnataka so when you do all this then concentrate right explanation need to write it write and rewrite devote a six time for writing it is not over in three months then we do only a hot spot job so when you write when you write your thesis when you write uh, your tables in a, in a very very elaborate manner then you understand that yes there is some substance in the data that you have collected you will find interesting evidences for your hypothesis and that will be reflected in your data definitely it will be reflected any data which has got plus 30 greater than or equal to 30 is a good sample size and you multiply that for each of the subgroups suppose in you have got uh, two genders 
people from three different localities and people who have three different education background people who have three different uh, economic background so two times three times three times three so two times three six six times two is 12 12 times three is uh, 36 36 six times 30 so about 1000 people you need to collect in order to describe the, uh, the 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 population that i just said so it is enough if uh, i like a stratum it is enough people living in rural semi urban and urban areas you have at least 30 people men and women you minimum have about 30 people people who are in high income middle income and low income group minimum 30 people people in four different occupations 30 people people not so educated and educated 30 people. so all this put together each of the sub group is 30 then it comes to about 36 sub groups then you need to uh, collect data from at least 1120 something so that you can be sufficiently confident that you can represent the whole population that you are describing it will not leave out certain people and if you are going to populate to the entire karnataka then you need to be representative of people from all walks of life in the whole of karnataka so divide that into six different groups and eight different geographical locations and try to collect the data from them so if you can do that then uh, it is fine study yes your objective is there but you have not uh, matched up with uh, the data collection then things can go wrong your conclusions may be not very correct the conclusions are not very correct that is what is the problem so your objectives are fine but when we draw, want to draw the conclusion if that sample is not reflective it is not accurate it is not representational of the population that is where our problem is so if you can do all that and come to certain findings and conclusions yes which whether it matches up with the theoretical construct yes whether it is uh, validating the earlier studies results fine if it validates fine otherwise find out reason why people are behaving like this if you are talking about two three different subgroups four different subgroups you can do wonders with uh, karnataka kerala tamil nadu and all this phd thesis who people are doing if it can be representative why we are talking about school going children their uh, ongoing class habits if you want to talk about the ongoing uh, uh, the, 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 the net, uh, net classes that are being handled or tortured by the by the so called school administration to the children if you want to find that and try to find out how people switch on and then sleep or switch on and do other activities mummy go and give response to my teacher she wants uh, my answers why don't you do that i want to go and drink water and come so if the children are going to say that and we want to do that if you want to study all those behavior then you can take a sample from all the four states and say that uh, southern people behave like this if if there is a change then you go change and be registered people here are very serious people if you want to draw certain conclusions you can do that provided that data is uh, representative provided that you collected sufficiently scientific data to do that you want to map or to do that you have and obviously by the name i suggest it simply says that it is uh, totally urban oriented for selecting one uh, bangalore go to 50 kilometers down south and collect one uh, village in uh, bangalore come to chennai collect uh, 50 kilometers south of uh, chennai go to a village whichever point that it uh, donates uh, denotes go there and try to collect data from there trivandrum next to trivandrum 50 kilometers go collect so if you can do that go to an interior village in karnataka interior semi urban village in tamil nadu kerala and andhra pradesh then your sample can be that is the reason why we say take a sample unit which is representative of urban semi urban and rural so if you can collect 50 students so for that what you should do identify schools if you are going to talk about a class schools <coughs> if you are going to talk about kendri vidyalayas if you are going to talk about hep schools which charge 1 lakh and more then children will be blessed with uh, only uh, cell phones with stands and other things with the hi fi network and uh, you have no problem but one of my students when i started organizing online classes he said sir i don't have a cell phone 
I said, go to your neighbor, go with her and uh, sit and uh, watch that. And I will agree that I will mark your attendance if both of you show in the same uh, camera. So I had to adjust to that. So where will this be accounted? Nobody would have thought about the fact that my student can go without a cell phone. Even today, he doesn't have a cell phone. Many of my students are on the street uh, selling um, masks. I know my, 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 my children, they are not like in Madras, they are not like in uh, uh, Coimbatore. So well, where will you go? Where will you allow negotiation for these kind of spaces? That is the reason why I say that, uh, yes, your mobile connectivity, the last mile connectivity for access to this uh, should be equitable for that the government will have to plan and give you something. And unless you give those things and the nitty gritty is solved, it is not possible to go jumbo with your uh, online classes. It is very nice to have people from all over the country listening to you. And uh, there are about 100 people uh, 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 congregated in, in various parts uh, in, with their telepresence, which is a very good sign. But uh, for persons who are desirable, but uh, who are desirous of joining you, but they don't have the smartphone facility, still people have the key phones. Still people can't afford the 149 rupees for bandwidth. And the bandwidth is being consumed by the data, your Wi-Fi and your uh, net connectivity. It saps your energy. Their battery is not very strong. And my video and other things. So where will you account for all this? So that is the reason why people have to have their ears to the ground. And all this will have to be accounted when you talk about the efficacy of online classes for school children. You pressurize the parents, you ask the parents to come. Now it is an additional burden on the parents to sit with the kid and don't play, don't do this, don't, hey, don't eat, go, sit on the class and all that. So all this shouting is being uh, undone by the, the young parents because uh, the children, they can't sit uh, for, for, for hours on end. 40 minutes is a long time and it's not possible. So who are you, who are us to, who are we to go and uh, advise the government and say that uh, 20 minutes uh, more than 20 minutes it's not possible we need to adjust to the uh, screen time so my power problem uh, uh, the fluctuation and the radiation that it might cause uh, definitely is going to have on the irritation and that's going to have uh, unknown disturbances to my cerebral system who is going to assess that you are saying mask and my people wear the mask only after this. And there is no use. And uh, some people, they have it like your uh, well, style, uh, like my beard, and the mask doesn't cover the mouth or the uh, nose. And uh, those problems are there. And the WHO came with a very small sample study. Well, that is not enough. You go see people, take the sample and try to find out uh, how the third way can be combated. So, but, uh, but and uh, amidst all this, we have all the social uh, uh, media platforms uh, uh, talking about so many things that are uh, surrounding the, the vaccination program. So this sample, uh, I think uh, uh, I, I did not do justice to the whole of uh, the huge area called sample, but, but uh, to, to understand sampling and anything related to your data, you need to know the vocabulary. The vocabulary could be the population, the sample, the sampling technique, the method, the major divisions of uh, sampling, and uh, how that can be strategized, how that can be adopted, and how that can be implemented. If you are uh, comfortable with all this, then I think you are ready for data collection. And to do that, you need to do a lot of uh, small time homework. Don't depend on your research scholar, either your research supervisor, he may not teach you all this, but there are hundreds and thousands of PPTs and YouTubes that will teach you. One of my scholars came and asked me about F test. I said, you go see 10 F test videos and come and tell me what you did not understand. So after that, he, he stopped coming to me. I only spoke to him about the post hoc, then he understood. Because F test can be taught by YouTube much better than anybody. So I encourage them to do that. So that cannot be an excuse for the scholars. The scholars, for doing good research, they need to understand sampling, they need to understand this, and they need to come and engage their teachers in a final discussion of the sample method rather than trying to understand what sample is. So that should be the level at which our PhD scholars that will be desirable. 
because uh, now I know because we need to talk about uh, the, the, the sociology of uh, appointments and, uh, and, and the social structure of appointments. So these days getting into a, a government system is not very easy. Uh, have uh, your your excellent grades and excellent university uh, diplomas, but that is not enough. So to do that, you need to go to knock at the doors of good private institutions and uh, wherever uh, jobs are available across the globe. And to do that, they require good publication. For that, they require a subject knowledge. So you say research methodology, people will be asking you what is a construct, what is a variable, what is an independent variable vis-a-vis -vis an intervening variable. So all this, it is our bounden duty to understand because you are a research scholar. So don't blame on anybody. Don't blame on the system. It is up to us to excel in whatever we do. Try to study as much as possible. Try to review about 150 articles, books, and periodicals before submitting a synopsis to your guide and make him happy in the sense that uh, if my scholar has studied about 100, 150 articles, I'm very happy, but I'm not uh, able to do that consistently. A couple of them I've done in the past uh, one dozen uh, doctorates that I have sent. The uh, rest of the people there uh, uh, they, they, they have traveled that distance, but then we still we encourage them to do that. So if you can, if you can accumulate and gather the the gathering uh, uh, snow, uh, the, the the rolling snow gathers momentum. So you you while while on your journey during PhD, you you study, you sit and study the articles and the and publications of your uh, maybe people coming and seeking guidance. If the guide has uh, supervised about 10 different theses, at least they, may, must, they must be mandated to read all the 10 theses before coming to uh, a research problem. That, that much I can at least uh, uh, assure you that will do a lot of good to you. So to do that, you require a lot of hard work, PhD. Uh, that, that, is a, that is a pride. That is, that is a pride that you need to understand. So they have taken so much of pains to organize this uh, lecture. I really, really wish that more, more such uh, uh, things do happen and the benefit uh, the scholars, even during this pandemic, he has been very enthusiastic. Uh, uh, the department headed by Purna has done uh, wonderful work. I am really pleased. And if it has served an iota of the objective for which it was uh, organized, I will be very happy. And maybe we can feel uh, some of the questions that are uh, that are to be expected from the scholars. I'll be very happy if uh, time permits and if Purna and his team permit, uh, we will be able to have some uh, uh, some questions. And I'll be very happy to discuss with you. Thank you very much. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nadrajan, for that uh, elaborate and uh, you know insightful explanation you know of uh, all these sampling uh, techniques and you made it very simple you know by giving such examples uh, and um, and you know one of the few uh, uh, you know teachers of mass communication uh, who has a who has an amazing grasp of statistics uh, so so you are you are really talking about uh, some of the tests that uh, you know, normally used in uh, communication uh, research. I'm happy you mentioned all that. Now, uh, uh, you know, if there are uh, uh, questions or if there is any opinion on uh, uh, sampling, anything, it is uh, open for discussion now. And Natarajan, I will. Uh, um, please, <laughs> please. You know, you know, you know. You, uh, I mean, you talked about the sub samples like, uh, you know, urban, semi-urban, and rural. So uh, many a time, uh, our students have uh, problems defining these. You know, these these So, what would you suggest? What are the ways to uh, you know, define what is urban, what is semi-urban, what is uh, actually rural. Sir, a, a very, a very practical and a very defining question uh, for the benefit of the scholars. 
professor has raised uh, if if uh, if if you can come to a very simple and a logical uh, understanding of uh, urban semi urban and rural we can go to the government uh, site we can go to the government uh, classification we can go to instead of uh, co converting that or labeling that as urban semi urban and rural we could go to a panchayat and a gram panchayat and a town panchayat and a municipality a corporation and uh, and uh, the, the bigger one the metropolitan uh, uh, culture so this can be reflective and it can coincide with urban semi urban and rural a gram panchayat cannot uh, exist probably in hyderabad i don't know there can be a small gram panchayat about 40 kilometers from the center of uh, your place where uh, there could be it could be inside uh, hyderabad and the uh, busy area but still that could be a gram panchayat so uh, as he has said people if you have difficulty then you need to go and try to uh, fix uh, the, the 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 revenue department classification where there is a village administrative officer where uh, i think in my place there is a village administrative officer there is a revenue inspector there is a up beyond that there is a tehsildar and after that there is a block development officer then there is a rdo then it goes to the district administration so if uh, a place which is uh, which comes under the purview of a uh, village bao Uh, like like your gram panchayat where there is one small uh, office where everything pds and all other things are uh, uh, handled so we could take that area and uh, people who are familiar with that type of uh, uh, structure revenue structure we can take so i usually encourage my students to go and find out socio economic surveys anything that is uh, already booked and there which is standard operating procedures for all other uh, uh, students all other uh, people in the department of sociology they follow this very judiciously so we can take their classification from the census data and we can do that otherwise a, a village a, a gathering a, a, a geographical area where the population does not exceed 1000 a population that does not exceed 5000 a population does not exceed 10000 then 1 lakh then uh, five lakhs and above so all this can be defined it is there and uh, students will have to just make a small uh, effort and they can define that in their thesis very clearly thank you yes sir good afternoon sir yes sir yes. Uh, this is ravindra uh, from hyderabad sir uh, thank you yes. for the elaborate session and it was very insightful uh, on uh, sampling technique and uh, which uh, by thank you very much initiated curiosity so to learn more sir and one thing i would like to ask sir we have mentioned so many subgroups na sir so how to decide when we are uh, selecting a topic or a thesis uh, topic how to decide uh, how many subgroups have to be taken and uh, 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 how to go about it sir right Uh, we can we can uh, once once the objectives are decided then you will use a, a tool to collect data at the time of uh, the tool construction you can raise very specific questions that will define your subgroup for example if you can uh, ask their uh, socio economic status as number of uh, uh, persons who are earning in your family that will give us an understanding of whether the family as a unit has got so many earning members you are highest level of educational qualification that will allow us to find out whether they are literate or illiterate whether they have done this whether uh, they qualify for uh, a school final whether they qualify for a diploma or other degree so that can be fixed once you come from that stage then each and every like uh, if it is an independent variable then the personality traits can be included and attitudes can be cross tabulated with personality types you have to have these demographics very strongly uh, gender may not reflect in your uh, analysis your uh, locality may not uh, reflect but some uh, time your your uh, family income can have uh, a bearing on your uh, attitude scale so the demographics that you are asking will be very specific and those questions will have to definitely have a bearing on your cross tabulation so when you 
design your questionnaire the questionnaire should have these item whether at the be, uh, beginning or in the end so let it be very straight and those questions five or six or seven and these questions can be cross tabulated with your dependent variables for later in depth analysis thank you sir yes thank you good evening natarajan sir please sir this is kanan from rice okay. university <clears throat> Can you can you talk a little louder? Everybody should uh, should hear you. Good evening, sir. This is Kannan from Christ University, Bangalore. How are you, sir? Doctor Kannan. Yeah. Please. Yeah, sir. One small question. I um, mean, clarification. Before that, uh, I enjoyed the session. Uh, thank, thank you for the organizers you, and thank you so much, sir. Um, Doctor Kannan teaches in Christ University. Uh, uh, a long time uh, teacher there. he was our phd scholar and he came out meritoriously he defended his thesis in my department and now he is teaching in christ one of the key figures in the department of communication christ university bangalore thank, thank you sir thank you so much for your kind words uh, <laughs> sir that uh, clarification required here is uh, uh, some scholars they they repeatedly saying that uh, you know adopting non probability sampling technique is uh, not advisable for the research right. or relying right. only on non probability sampling data is not advisable uh, right. so that's why they just try to connect with uh, some other methodology data from some other methodology right uh, so in the present context how relevant it is sir yes uh, if you are if you are uh, talking about uh, very specifically the the cause of uh, the covid pandemic vis a vis vaccination the relationship between the first and the second vaccination doses and uh, your oxygen uh, input specific questions specific strains all these data maybe you cannot generalize it to others and it requires very stringent statistical procedure and uh, we require because it's a life and death matter whereas the entire uh, surmise of our social sciences theory is based on the duplication of the field trials of the biostatistics to our present trial it is to treat my methodology with your methodology and try to say whether this treatment is efficient or not we are not going to say the efficacy as such what we are trying to say the students from my class and the students from your class if they are put together if they exhibit no population difference then the f test will return a ne negative or a insignificant result if the f test is positive then it means that the samples are from two different distinct groups it is only duplication of that statistic you cannot strictly say like you give 10 ml water to this uh, paddy field 20 ml water per crop to this paddy field and try to locate and lift the sample from that it is not a physical characteristic like in sciences department we are going to extrapolate and extend that and treat it like a subject and try to make an assessment and try to find out whether this quantitative techniques can be implemented to qualitative research also we are left with only no choice but to ask 100 different people and there is no guarantee that uh, those 100 answers are reflective of their true self we don't even know whether they have spoken the truth or not it is all based on the surmise so to that extent i would definitely go with people who say that statistics performed on numbers immaterial whether it is taken at random or not i will go with that group and support the fact that whether the normality is achieved whether it is satisfied i will not bother about that i will go ahead with the the, the, the procedures and try to reflect and say that it is insignificant and significant to that extent that my sample is adequately representative of the population and yes i used that and i defended the thesis so there are reviews available there are people who are hardcore purist and say that uh, non parametric either uh, <clears throat> cannot be used to uh, parametric statistics cannot be used for a, a non normalized distribution i don't agree about, uh, with that school i will go and defend to any extent and say that 
parametric statistics, can be factor analysis, can be used for the data generated for a 50 item questionnaire for my thesis. I classify get, get two factors. I studied the factors and definitely will say that it is reflective of the population because it is social science. That leeway is there and I will strongly defend that. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your Welcome. clarification. Sir, uh, you. one, one small follow-up question. Uh, you mentioned uh, critical discourse analysis uh, in the presentation. So how far it is, uh, I mean, um, uh, functioning for the researcher to adopt critical discourse analysis uh, for the quantitative data analysis? The CDA for the samples uh, I was mentioning, the critical discourse analysis will uh, depend on excellent, uh, voluminous and extensive qualitative data. We glean from that uh, the critical discourse and try to ascertain whether the standpoint is re uh, reflected or not. So to do that, we do go for sampling and whether that sampling is adequate and reflective of the population. And the critical discourse analysis purely is a qualitative data. Let us not talk about sampling to CDA. CDA is meant for a text, a particular text like case study or ethnometrology. And you, you, you depend and you defend it by your critical discourse based on what is reflected uh, semantically, syntactically and discourse wise. No so you meant, you meant yes. to say critical discourse analysis is for uh, analyzing qualitative data, not quant quantitative data. Uh, generally, it is used only for qu quantity, qualitative yeah, yeah. data. And CDA, and as the technique itself says, that it, it, it believes in uh, deconstructing what is uh, there in the discourse and try to say that this is what he's trying to say, though he's saying this in so many words. So the critical discourse will, 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 will reflect and it will depend on uh, your, your idea of uh, what is your perspective. And from this perspective, this is what is reflected in this. This is what I think they have said, rather than saying this is what they said. Okay. So Thank critical you. discourse believes in your acumen rather than the general quantitative acumen. Maybe if somebody else reads that, they will not come to that conclusion. You justify that stand by your arguments and your uh, idea. CDA believes in that. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Welcome, Dr. Anand. Good evening, sir. Please. Yeah. Ama, can you be a little louder, please? Uh, sir, this is Loki Sir. Good evening, sir. Can you hear my voice, sir? Uh, uh, no. Can hear, but uh, can you speak a little louder? Yeah. Oh, um, sir, is it audible, sir? Ah, uh, slightly. Yeah. Yes, please. Sir, um, so regarding our PG students' research, uh, what is the minimum articles they are supposed to review before they start their research? Because uh, it for some students to be asked to present it, they'll bring one or two article, and they say that's it. We can't able to bring it. So what is the minimum number of articles they are supposed to uh, submit it as review uh, before they start their uh, proper research work? Ma, uh, it, it, it depends uh, from guide to guide. And uh, you can comfortably, for doing your research, n number of articles you can study, you can skim through, you can get data, and anything is possible. But to reflect to do original work and to deserve the prefix called PhD, we need to scan through, skim through and study and get into at least, in my opinion, about 100 and to 150 articles. You must have studied threadbare. You must have studied from cover to cover, from the starting of the letter of the title to the references and the last reference. You must understand all the authors. There are certain schools in your study and those schools you need to understand. A PhD scholar must be well-versed in about at least 25 to 30 textbooks in your area, about 150 articles in your area. before And all the, the thesis guided by your research, or your research supervisor in that area. If possible, all the thesis that are submitted by that department only then you will have a command and a grip over the study that you are going to undertake. 
it is a course work it is you can easily fool around you can easily gimmick you can easily get away with anything you do but that is not what we aim the aim of uh, dr purnananda to organize me all the way to organize all this he could have said all this everybody knows this but the aim is to make you at least understand the import of what it makes to organize the whole lecture program sitting there uh, making 100 phone calls we have been speaking for hours on end to do this so it is not easy to organize this still we have done this webinar and maybe somebody at some point in time will be motivated to do a better research that is our idea if you ask me honestly 150 articles 25 books text books from cover to cover without reading and completing and submitting a synopsis of this to the scholar to this supervisor you should not embark on your thesis that is my humble and honest opinion thank you sir Sir, I have a question. Please. So then, uh, how about uh, this uh, uh, sampling? Uh, yeah, sampling. Size, sir. Size. Sampling size. Sir, is it audible? Sampling size. Sampling size for PG level. They said uh, 150 will do or 100 will do for PG level. And for PG level, it is 500 to 700 that will do. Is there any standard... Uh, Sample size for PG and MPhil and PhD like that, sir. For an MA thesis, you can contact fifty people, hundred people. Nobody is going to uh, bother about it because it is the methodology. It is just a precursor to your thesis for MPhil and PhD. If you are coming for a PhD, each and every line that you write. Hello, sir. Plagiarist, the uh, brilliant scholar. You add value to the department. If you are not a brilliant scholar, then it is not a value addition for the department, which is a disadvantage to the guide, to the department, and to the whole of the university. So we live up to the expectation of the university. To do that, if the sample based on which the entire thesis and the construct everything rest will be better if you have about 30 30 is about 1050 don't need to put a minimum number if you talking about each sub group each sub group will be a large sample in statistics large sample is 30 or more so what i want you to got two three and three parameters times 30 that is what should be your or rule of thumb it is not a strict rule but it is a rule of thumb they say so 18 times 20 30 independent variables are more then which means you need to have more sample what i am trying to say gender two then uh, locality three then uh, educational qualification four or five so two three and five how much two three and five rendu moon r r and 30 30 times 30 is 900 so a simple rule will be 900 is the sample size for three variables which consists of two levels three levels and three levels that is what is the uh, rule so don't be don't be worried about the sample it is enough you will know that each sub uh, strata should be at least 30 and if that is the rule then you will not be bothered about 100 and 200 the number will be there you must go multiply that number if you can justify this to your guide fine it is your uh, mandate to justify with your guide not the guide's mandate to come and tell you go collect so many sample you tell him you tell her this is what is the number sir madam this is this fine based on a scientific fact and people say 638 is a good number 
So anything more than 638, if you can sufficiently manipulate and put it in your uh, subgroup, fine. But at least that is uh, to, be, to be on paper. To get this 638, you need to collect about uh, 850 to 900 samples to get a complete aspect of uh, all the questions filled at least uh, 638. So the non-compliance also comes into picture. Not everybody completes and gives you the question. If they say, I have collected 638 and all 638 are good, then it means uh, it's a blatant white lie. It cannot be. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. I listened to a lecture after a long time. Very interesting lecture given by you, sir. You are Thank very you kind. So Thank sir. you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hello, sir. This is Ilya Samudratar from Kashmir. Uh, I am pursuing PhD at Islamic University of Science and Technology, Avantipura. Uh, my question is that a year before my I I was I was willing to work on a proposal. It was child sexual abuse in Kashmir, but my proposal was rejected based on the fact that they said that neither enough data is available for this, and uh, you cannot have enough uh, this. Uh, um, uh, material available for it so you cannot work on it so under such circumstances can you kindly elaborate how how what how should a uh, researcher proceed under such, such circumstances what is he going to do because child sexual abuse it is rampant in, in jammu and kashmir as of now so but the data isn't available that much that you can carry out a research on it. what what was your what was your objective what child is your area yeah, uh, I, I am I am a student of mass communication and journalism, and I was willing to work on child sexual abuse in Kashmir. <laughs> okay, uh, 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 my dear scholar, um, Ilya, there are uh, certain things uh, which are uh, dreamt of by ideal research scholars, but uh, to complete that will be very difficult. And uh, you are talking, if I'm not wrong, uh, you're talking about child sex abuse. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Child sexual abuse okay. in Kashmir. And, and, and this, this involves uh, enforcement agencies. This involves people who are in power. This involves people who have the authority. And uh, you cannot that easily take this uh, data. What the doctoral committee has said is, uh, yeah. uh, if not absolutely correct, it is correct. It will be very difficult for you to get any quantitative data and you can probably base your entire thesis on these child sex victims, which, which can number about 10 or 15. Even that will be very difficult because you cannot identify them and you can only have a confidential interview and reflecting on the confidential interview and giving us an information we will be, it will be very hard to implant veracity and authenticity to the document that you are submitting to us for the simple reason that it cannot be corroborated. It is not a legal study. It becomes difficult for the communication scholar to implement ethics. And the, the, the doctoral committee is right in saying that we are enthusiastic in doing certain lofty topics, but it is way beyond the reach and uh, it is very difficult in a situation where, like in Kashmir, you cannot go and ask these questions and get answers to them. And uh, the, when, the, when the perpetrator is uh, in power, then it becomes all the more difficult for uh, uh, authentic answers to come. It is not possible. So kindly uh, do something which is less uh, inflammable, do something which is less uh, controversial, and do something which is... Uh, less dangerous to your life and safety. It is not safe to do this, yes. in my humble opinion. Yeah. Okay, and I, thank I, you. I think he thank also you. needs uh, clearance from ethics committee if he's, uh, you know, dealing with a hospital or something, with an institution. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Sir, thank you. Uh, thank you. There is a question. Uh, are you saying the question? Please. Uh, there, is, there is a question. Uh, for the popular subject, uh, we can have a number of references, but uh, when we are digging an unknown or untouched matter, how many references are needed? Um, 
<laughs> so this is the is... Uh, question. <laughs> Please. <laughs> <laughs> There is that oh, has asked from Mangalore. From Mangalore, okay. Uh, if if um, there is nothing called the untouched and unknown uh, subjects, yes. all <laughs> subjects are yeah. dealt with, and if it is new to the research, then it is all the more difficult for you to go and uh, uh, excavate those data. Maybe it is archival data, maybe it is secondary data from other published sources. Or you will have to go do your legwork and try to ascertain firsthand from people uh, who are involved with that. So it makes it difficult, but it is not ungettable. Like, like yeah. if it is less controversial, if it is like in the earlier question, we said it is not possible because there are so many layers of security involved and there are NGOs who are operating, the enforcement agency will come, legal aspects will come, and the social defense ministry will come. All these will apply their own pressure and it becomes difficult for you to complete it on time. If it is a government project, then you can go with that authority. But if it is not government, then for PhD, nobody will impart uh, that kind of a data. So that is a difficulty. If you are talking about an exotic topic, it becomes interesting for you. You will have to do more legwork. That's all. But it is not ungettable. And I don't think any topic uh, which is beyond the grasp and reach of uh, the scholars. You can do it. Kindly go ahead. Do some legwork. That's all is required. Yeah. So if... if um... Um, if there are no questions, um, uh, we can end the session. So thank you so much, uh, Natarajan, uh, for spending your valuable time and uh, you know enriching us with uh, you know such wonderful explanation of uh, you know you know sampling uh, procedures and you know with examples you made it so easy. I'm thankful to you. So on behalf of uh, our university and on behalf of the department, uh, I express my uh, gratitude to you. Thank you so much. Purna, as always, yeah. since our first meeting, you have been a very deep person, a knowledgeable and a scholar at work. And I still appreciate your valuable friendship and acquaintance. And you have been very kind to give me this chance. And uh, I had the chance to meet so many people online. I am open for any discussion. You kindly collect my number from anybody. Yeah. And I will be very happy to help at any point in time for anybody who wants clarification in, uh, in subjects like this. It has been yeah. a pleasure knowing uh, Purna, his colleagues, Satish and uh, Varghese and others. And uh, thank you very much for this nice opportunity. You made yeah. this life wonderful and day wonderful. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I also thank... Uh, our chairman, uh, Satish Kumar. Yes. And uh, the present chairman is Satish Kumar himself. Okay. Um, oh. Yes, uh, he, he, he is from Mangalore. He was a student in Mangalore University nearly oh. uh, two, two uh, decades ago. So oh. he has been teaching here from, uh, from uh, day one of this uh, department. Oh, 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 Satish. Okay, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, so wait, I thank wait, wait, Satish. Wait, wait, I also thank uh, Professor Varghese. And uh, also my colleague Satish Kumar and uh, the teachers of the department, the students, PhD scholars, and also the technical staff uh, who actually uploaded uh, the live video to the YouTube. And I also uh, <clears throat> thank the scholars who have joined from different parts of uh, the country. So I thank you, one and all. Thank you so much. All, all my colleagues, learned colleagues, and uh, for everybody, for all those yes. aspiring to do research, I, yes. I wish to place on record my thanks and gratitude. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Have a thank wonderful you. day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. Bye, Natarajan. Bye. 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 Thank you, sir. Thank you.